The medium of animation has always held a special appeal to me, particularly two-dimensional animation, but also stop-motion and even 3D CGI as well. With it, the visual potential of a work is essentially limitless beyond constraints of time, talent, and budget in a way that live-action filmmaking just can't quite reach. Animation provides boundless freedom to play with character designs, backgrounds and set pieces, color, and other visual aspects, because every piece of every frame is artificially created. Many of my favorite movies are animated, but there's one in particular I'd like to focus on today, and that is the formerly obscure turned fairly well-regarded classic from the year of my birth, the 1995 film Balto. I watched a lot of movies growing up, and I enjoyed plenty of them, but few stuck with me the way Balto did. I must have watched it dozens of times as a kid, and even to this day, simply hearing a bit of the soundtrack is like a shot of liquid nostalgia straight into my veins. Balto is a highly fictionalized retelling of the 1925 serum run, also known as the Great Race of Mercy, by which, in the midst of an outbreak of diphtheria among the population of extremely remote Nome, Alaska during terrible winter conditions, a relay of dog sled teams was organized to travel 674 miles to deliver vital antitoxins. But like with all great stories, I think it's best we start at the beginning. In the northern reaches of Alaska, barely two degrees south of the Arctic Circle, lies the small town of Nome. Founded at the tail end of the 19th century, the settlement's population skyrocketed nearly overnight after the discovery of gold in nearby Anvil Creek. Within weeks, the number of inhabitants swelled as thousands flocked to the remote frontier holding in an attempt to strike it rich and by the time of its incorporation in 1901, Nome had a known population of 12,000, with estimates that rose to over 20,000 when accounting for transient fortune seekers, making it the most populous city in the entire Alaska Territory. But as the first decade of the 20th century drew to a close, so too did the prospects of finding gold in the Nome Mining District dwindle. By 1910, the population of Nome had dropped to a little over 2,500 individuals, and by the autumn of 1924, Slightly under 1,500 people resided in and around the town. Each year, encroaching ice in the Bering Sea would make travel over water impossible from early to mid-November until the following spring, leaving the subarctic port town cut off from the rest of the world for a sizable portion of the year. Not relishing the prospect of being left to endure raging blizzards and bitter cold with scant daylight for months on end, many of the town's inhabitants would depart by ship. As the Gnome Chronicle, the town's newspaper, wrote of this time of year, We are prisoners in a jail of ice and snow. The last boat may be justifiably considered to have gone, and this little community is left to its own resources, alone with the storms, alone with the darkness and chill of the north. Those who chose to remain behind and brave the winter months were served by only one doctor, a man by the name of Curtis Welch, and four nurses. Earlier that year, when performing an inventory check, Welch had noticed that the Nome Hospital's batch of diphtheria antitoxin was expired, and dutifully placed an order for replacements. However, due to a clerical error, when the Alameda, the last ship of the year, arrived that fall, fresh antitoxin was not among her cargo. As Welch had never before encountered an outbreak of diphtheria, it did not seem to be an urgent matter, and the hospital staff expected to receive fresh antitoxin the following spring. But shortly after the Alameda's departure, a family of Alaska natives from the nearby village of Holy Cross arrived at Nome with their sick two-year-old son. Dr. Welch examined the boy, finding his throat inflamed and his body emaciated. Suspecting diphtheria, he questioned the parents, but to his relief, they assured him that none of the other inhabitants of their village, including the boy's siblings, were exhibiting any symptoms. Diphtheria is a highly contagious disease, especially so among Alaska natives who at the time made up about a third of Nome's population and the vast majority of the tens of thousands of inhabitants of the surrounding district. As no one else showed symptoms, Welch chalked up the boy's illness to a minor infection and did his best to treat him. To his dismay, the boy would die the following morning, and soon, others would arrive showing his exact same symptoms. Meanwhile, a number of native Alaskan children would succumb to conditions attributed to tonsillitis, but as was custom, their families would frequently bury their dead without allowing an autopsy to be performed, and were often reluctant to let doctors examine their ill. And Dr. Welch, for all his expertise, had neither the experience nor means necessary to identify diphtheria beyond visual inspection. Christmas week of 1924 saw the hospital staff dealing with a number of children sick with colds, 
and so it was not until well into January of 1925 that he had proper cause to suspect something more sinister was at work among those under his care. When reports of the deaths of numerous native children on the outskirts of town reached him, Dr. Welch began to suspect the worst. But it was not until the 20th of January that he encountered serious evidence of the growing pandemic. A three-year-old boy was brought to the hospital suffering from fever, fatigue, and a sore throat, symptoms which soon gave way to raspy, labored breathing, and the buildup of necrotic tissue in the boy's throat. Given his inability to confirm the disease, the town's limited supply of diphtheria antitoxin, and the fact that said antitoxin was expired, and therefore might have not only failed to work but caused other harmful side effects, Welch tried to provide alternative treatments, but after brief initial improvements, the child's condition worsened, and by evening the boy was dead. Welch now had every reason to believe that the town was facing an epidemic. Diphtheria has now been almost entirely eradicated throughout the developed world thanks to vaccination, and widespread availability of antitoxin meant that even in the early 1900s, the disease was not considered a threat in most of the United States. But Nome's isolation put the town's inhabitants at unique risk. Diphtheria is a disease caused by bacterial infection of the nose and throat, inducing both physical fatigue and mental exhaustion before progressing over the course of several days to fever, congestion of the lungs, and necrosis of the lining of the throat. The bacterial growths combine with clotted blood and dead tissue to constrict the throat slowly and painfully suffocating the victims. It is a terrible and lengthy way to die, and while mortality among healthy adults is relatively low, at around 5-10%, to this can reach as high as 20% among children and the elderly. To make matters worse, a significant number of the people living in and around Nome were native Alaskans, who were much more vulnerable to many diseases than the European-descended inhabitants. Welch had witnessed this firsthand during the Spanish flu pandemic towards the end of the 1910s, which killed over 8% of the entire native population of Alaska. On January 21st, Welch was called out to a native village on the outskirts of town, where he found another child exhibiting the same symptoms as his prior patient. Despite being administered antitoxin, she, too, would die before nightfall. Now certain of the severity of the situation, Welch summoned the mayor and town council to an emergency meeting, and Nome was placed under immediate and severe quarantine. Given their extremely limited supply of long-expired antitoxin, an urgent dispatch was sent along Alaska's telegraph lines to the territorial capital in Juneau. An epidemic of diphtheria is almost inevitable here. I am in urgent need of one million units of diphtheria antitoxin. Mail is only form of transportation. I have made application to Commissioner of Health of the Territories for antitoxin already. There are about 30,000 white natives in the district. Within a few days, Hundreds of thousands of units of antitoxin had been located in various West Coast hospitals, which were shipped up to Seattle, and then to Anchorage. However, due to the wintry conditions in the Bering Sea, delivery by ship, ordinarily the most convenient method, would not be possible. Alaska's rail network connected many of the southern cities and towns to the interior of the territory, but the trains only ran as far as Nanana, a small town in central Alaska that lay nearly 700 miles from Nome. The isolated town was not connected to the rest of the territory by any roads either, and automobiles of that time would never have been able to traverse a blizzard regardless. And those same conditions made it nearly impossible to even get aircraft off the runway. With temperatures plummeting to as low as minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit, winds reaching up to 75 miles per hour, and driving ice and snow, the only option left was to deliver the antitoxin the old-fashioned way, by dog sled. On January 26th, the governor of the Alaska Territory, Scott Bone, gave instructions for a relay of sled dog drivers to be set up between Nanana and Nome, spread out in order that no one team would be exposed to the brutal subarctic conditions for too long. Enter Leonard Seppala. Born in Norway, Seppala had emigrated to Alaska years before, and had earned widespread fame throughout the territory as a sled dog racer, trainer, and breeder. At the head of his team was his prized dog Togo a black-and-brown Alaskan husky who had been with Seppala for all 12 years of the dog's life. Despite his age, Togo remained a formidable lead dog, and Seppala trusted him to head his team through what would prove to be the greatest challenge of both their lives. At 11 p.m. on January 27th, the antitoxin shipment arrived by rail in the town of Nanana, 674 miles from Nome. Wishing to waste no time, Wild Bill Shannon, another famous musher, set off at once for the disease-stricken town. The same day, 
Leonard Seppala and his team departed from Nome with the intention of meeting the antitoxin shipment out on the trail. Shannon's team endured an arduous 52-mile journey that would leave the musher's face severely frostbitten and would end up claiming the lives of three of his dogs. The shipment was then passed from team to team over the next few days, with most groups in the relay carrying it between 25 to 35 miles. Meanwhile, Seppala, Togo, and their team traveled 170 miles out from Nome between January 27th and the 31st. Here, by chance, they ran into the team led by Henry Ivanov, whose dogs had become tangled after a run-in with caribou. Seppala's team then carried the antitoxin another 91 miles across some of Alaska's most dangerous terrain in the midst of some of the worst weather conditions in recorded history. During this leg of the relay, with the wind chill reaching minus 85 degrees Fahrenheit, Seppala was often unable to see his path, and relied on Togo to find the correct route, with virtually no assistance. After traveling for more than 12 hours, Seppala and Togo finally located the next team in the relay, and passed on their precious cargo. Many of Seppala's dogs collapsed from the exertion, but not Togo. Upon being released from his harness, and despite having covered a total of 261 miles over the previous six days, the 12-year-old husky immediately took off after passing caribou. Back in Nome, the number of confirmed diphtheria cases had risen to 28, with several confirmed deaths, though more were believed to be occurring on the outskirts of town. The next runner in the relay, Charlie Olson, traveled 25 miles before handing off the serum to the following team. Its musher, Gunnar Kaysen, was an employee of Sepala's who made an unusual choice for his lead dog. Balto was a six-year-old husky that until then had shown no great promise, so much so that his owner, Leonard Seppala, had relegated him to being a midline freight dog. With his team ready, Kaysen set out, relying on Balto to guide them when visibility became so poor that the musher could no longer see the trail. When they came to the final handoff point and found the next team in the relay unprepared, thinking that Kaysen's team would have been held up by the blizzard, Kaysen made the controversial decision to push on to Nome himself covering a total of 53 miles and arriving shortly before dawn. As a result of nationwide coverage, both in newspapers and by radio, the story of the Great Race of Mercy was followed by tens of millions of people as it occurred, and the successful delivery of the antitoxin was celebrated across the country and beyond. But as with many events, the general public got a much simpler story than the one that really occurred. Balto in particular was singled out as the sole hero of the relay, when in fact Togo had braved worse conditions and covered nearly five times his distance. Seppala and several of the other mushers in the relay even voiced doubts that Balto was indeed Kaysen's lead dog, given his prior track record, with some positing that it was actually a sled dog named Fox, whose name wasn't deemed as newsworthy as Balto's. Kaysen's decision to bypass the final team and head to Nome himself also drew some criticism. He assured the public that the final team was not prepared, and that he pressed on to save vital time, though others accused him of doing so out of desire for personal glory. Balto and his team would end up touring the country, receiving praise and celebration only to later languish under the ownership of various entertainers, while Togo and the other dogs were largely ignored. When a statue was erected in New York's Central Park in honor of the relay, it would be made in the likeness of Balto and even feature his name at the base though the awards on the statue's collar were modeled after those Togo had received. For the rest of his life, Seppala would insist that Togo's role in the relay had been unfairly ignored or diminished in favor of Balto's accomplishments. Ultimately, I think it's important to recognize the heroic efforts of all the men and dogs involved in the relay, and to understand that it was not the undertaking of any one individual. If you're looking for a fascinating and in-depth retelling of the gripping real-life events, I highly recommend the book The Cruelest Miles by authors Gay and Laney Salisbury. Regardless, as far as public awareness of the events went, Balto was the one figure that remained consistently associated with the 1925 serum run. Fast forward more than six decades, to 1989. The Disney Renaissance is just about to begin, and Don Bluth, Steven Spielberg, and George Lucas have just had a major hit the prior year with The Land Before Time. Spielberg's brand new animation division, Amblimation, sets to work on several films, the final of which will focus on the events of the 1925 serum run. Screenwriting duo Cliff Ruby and Alana Lesser developed a script for a highly fictionalized, almost folktale-like rendition of the relay based on stories the latter remembered her grandfather telling her in her childhood, 
while also taking inspiration from White Fang, portraying Balto as a half-wolf outcast from society. The two approached Simon Wells, the great-grandson of author H.G. Wells and supervising animator on Who Framed Roger Rabbit, who had recently been hired by Amblimation to direct two of their other upcoming features. Wells was taken with the idea at once, and together with Ruby and Lesser, enthusiastically lobbied Spielberg to greenlight the project. When Spielberg was concerned that a story with black and white dogs in a snowy landscape wouldn't be visually striking enough, the team brought him a number of pieces of production art that proved otherwise, and eventually he gave the go-ahead. In its writing, Balto appears to be a pretty standard children's film. The main character is an outcast stranded between two seemingly contradictory worlds, who longs to prove his worth and fit in. A crisis then arises, and when those celebrated by society fail to live up to expectations, he is able to step up and, using his unique talents, win the day, get the girl, and live happily ever after. But just looking at the script fails to do this movie justice, and this is where the title of this video comes in. From the beginning, the team set out to make Balto distinct from other animated movies of the time. As Simon Wells, the director, said, From the first draft of the script I read, I felt that Balto was a classic animated movie. Wanting to honor the real-life events but tell their own, almost fantasy-like version of them, a visual style was chosen that balanced realism and cartoonish stylization. Also, like The Land Before Time, but unlike the vast majority of American animated films, Balto would not include musical numbers, something that helped to maintain its more grounded tone. Art production occurred between 1989 and 1993 as the script was refined, with voice recordings being completed in the latter months of this time range. The animation itself was begun on March 1st, 1993, and took a little over a year to complete. Given the nature of Amblimation as a largely untested startup, the budget assigned to the project was roughly a third of what the average Disney animated feature of the time cost, meaning that the crew had to be especially careful when managing their resources. In order to achieve the proper visual aesthetic, background art was done with oil paints, giving softer edges to snow and other surfaces while early CGI particle effects were used for both Falling Snowflakes and the Aurora Borealis. The film would release on December 22nd, 1995, 25 years ago to the day of the original release of this video, only to earn modest revenue and quickly fade into obscurity, at least for a time. By the early 2000s, however, strong home media sales would find the film securing a place in the hearts of millions, including my own, and in a moment I'd like to explore why. Now, it must be said that ultimately, this is a children's movie, and its writing, symbolism, and themes reflect that. But this isn't a bad thing. As I've mentioned in earlier videos, it is just as important, if not even more so, that entertainment made for children be invested with effort and quality. After all, the stories and works of art one encounters in their youth can come to greatly influence developing minds, not only regarding imagination and creativity, but even in terms of character and ethics. As I stated in my video on the Animals of Farthing Wood series of novels, often, when criticism is leveled at certain types of stories, people will defend the flaws of the work by saying, it doesn't need to be well written, it's made for children. This is a terrible argument, and not only is it fallacious, it's downright harmful. The media that children consume can help to greatly shape their personalities, interests, and values, to inspire them and prepare them to take on the many challenges that life will inevitably throw their way. To entirely write off entertainment made with young audiences in mind as just for kids is to do a disservice to those young audiences, to accept mediocrity or worse in the media that will play a large and often crucial role in their development. Stories intended for children will naturally have certain limitations on them, but even so they can tackle some of the deepest, darkest, and most horrific subject matter in meaningful and resonant ways, so long as they do so delicately, with care and tact. While the target demographic for this film means that many of its aspects are rather simplistic in their execution, this is not inherently a problem. Just because something is simple doesn't mean that it can't be done well, or to great effect. In many regards, Balto is a fairly standard story, structured like many other kids' films. But I think it serves as an excellent example of the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. And so, without further delay, this is Balto and the art of animation. The film opens with a live-action sequence in New York City's Central Park, in the then-present day of the mid-1990s. 
As an elderly woman and her granddaughter come into view, we get our first taste of the late, great James Horner's magnificent score for the film. His use of soft, uplifting strings alongside drawn-out horn notes gives the music in the movie a heroic yet melancholic tone that suits the historical events perfectly, and evokes a sense of the cold far north and the struggle against the elements. James Horner produced a number of excellent soundtracks over the course of his distinguished career, but the one for Balto is certainly my favorite of his. As the pair wander through the park with a young husky dog, we learn that they are searching for a memorial. The live-action bookends do a great job of grounding the story in reality, but the film's writers cleverly use this framing device as an excuse to tell their own, folktale-like, almost fantasy-esque rendition of the real-life events. As Simon Wells, the director, would later explain, the live-action frame of the film does indicate that what we are being told is a childhood memory, and that it is being told to entertain a grandchild, so it may have considerable deviations from fact. Ultimately, arguments against the film's quality on a basis of historical accuracy boil down to the issue of adaptation versus originality, and while I can understand people being upset at the film choosing to deviate from historical truth, I am more concerned as to whether the film's screenplay remains consistent with itself. Given this framing device, as well as the respectful way the film handles the events it is admittedly loosely based on, I have no qualms with the final result. Sitting down, the grandmother begins her story, and we transition into the animated portion of the film, being greeted by the frozen Alaskan tundra. As the music builds, two teams of sled dogs burst onto the screen, racing across the white expanse. Here, we are introduced to the primary antagonist of our movie, the Malamute Steel, who demonstrates his character, or lack thereof, by snapping at a member of a rival sled team to cause them to crash in order to win a race. Steel is a pretty one-dimensional villain, but that's all the movie really needs him to be. He's vain, selfish, and aggressive, and cares only about maintaining his image in the eyes of others, a perfect foil for our main character, as we will soon see. The character designers and animators did a great job of conveying his nature through his appearance and movements, as his stark black and white coloring and striking ice blue eyes help to elevate his savage, predatory countenance and style of movement. Steel is played by veteran voice actor Jim Cummings, who really sells the character as an arrogant, malevolent force, managing to make each line delivered sound like a growl. Hey, out of my way, Lobo! Get out of here, wolf dog. You better get back to your pack. Everyone is fine. Touch that box, and I'll tear you apart. From here, we cut to the town of Gnome, where we are introduced to our main character, Balto. Balto is an outcast wolf dog who lives estranged from the other dogs of town on account of his heritage, but longs to be a part of a dog sled team. Dick Zondag, the chief animator and character designer for Balto, did an excellent job at making the character model visually distinctive while remaining in keeping with the rest of the movie's style. Having large, expressive eyes is a pretty standard trick in terms of animation design for providing insight into a character's emotions, but this movie uses that technique to great effect. Many of the best scenes in this film have little to no dialogue, instead simply allowing the audience to observe and letting the animation and music tell the story. Balto is voiced by Kevin Bacon, who does a really good job at giving a modest, down-to-earth performance. Jenna? Rosie's in there. In the hospital, why? I've seen a few professional reviews of the film that criticize him for not putting enough effort or enthusiasm into the role, but over-the-top flair was never necessary given the more grounded tone the film is going for. Bacon's delivery is alternately gruff and weary, soft and hesitant, somber when it needs to be fitting perfectly with both the character and the story in which he stars. I promise, Jenna. Go ahead, guys. Take her home. Character-wise, Balto is pretty standard as far as heroes come. He's intelligent, brave, and kind-hearted, but crippled with self-doubt on account of his heritage and outcast status. A kind of archetypal underdog hero, no pun intended. He longs to not only fit in among the other dogs of the town, but participate in, and even lead, a sled dog team someday. Every time is a race. You run around like you're in it. one day I will be. Balto is accompanied by Boris, a Russian snow goose voiced by Bob Hoskins, who serves as our hero's only true confidant. Hoskins brings a peculiar charm to the movie, serving as both wise mentor and comic relief, 
though unlike with many children's movies, his comical hijinks never get in the way of the plot or become too overbearing or distracting. Come on, we don't want to miss the finish. Oh, that would be a tragedy! <laughs> ah! The two head through the town in a neat little rooftop parkour sequence before we cut to a scene introducing one of the emotional cores of the movie. We see a family gathered in a carpenter's workshop, where the mother and father present their young daughter, Rosie, with a gift. A dog sled and a musher's cap. Jenna, Jenna, <laughs> you're a mean dog! Okay, just a minute. Come on, mush! It's a very wholesome scene, but this, along with the following sequence, sets up a few important elements of the story. Rosie has a strong bond with her dog, Jenna, a red husky who will serve as Balto's love interest. Her graceful, warmly colored character design intentionally contrasts both with the cold, harsh, and rigid design of Steel, who also pines after her, and with the rough, wild appearance of Balto. I'm afraid the only way Steel notices anyone is if they're wearing a mirror. As the family heads outside to witness the final leg of the race, Balto and Boris also watch from the sidelines. When Rosie's hat is blown into the path of the racers, Balto sees an opportunity to both show off in front of Jenna and feel as if he is participating in the race. But as he returns the hat, Rosie's father fearfully drives him away, remarking, Hey, hey Rosie, stay away from him! Dad! He might bite you, honey. He's part wolf. Here, we get to experience Balto's outcast status firsthand. And while he is driven away, Steel approaches Jenna, by whom he is rebuffed, before following after the wolf dog to taunt him. He gets some funny lines in. Oh, Balto. I've got a message for your mother. But we also see the joy he takes in gleefully taunting and even assaulting his rivals. Again, all of these setups are simple, but they do exactly what they need to. As Balto and Boris return to their ramshackle home, a derelict vessel on the outskirts of town, the two spot a pack of wolves in the distance, giving us this great scene. The wild wolf pack howls to Balto, as if wondering if he is one of their own, but Balto merely gives an uncomfortable look before passing on. Boris, watching, mutters, Not a dog. Not a wolf. All he knows is what he is not. Sure, it's a little on the nose, but then again, this is a kid's movie. Now I'd like to take a moment to talk about narrative conflict, which is usually divided into three primary classifications, man against man, man against nature, and man against self. These are the most common forms of conflict to be found in storytelling, and Balto incorporates all three into its plot, weaving them in and amongst each other. By this point, the film has already established two forms, man against man, or wolf dog against dog, to be more precise, in pitting our underdog protagonist against the imposing and belligerent steel, as well as the rest of the town, and man against self, in establishing how Balto suffers from an inferiority complex on account of his mixed heritage and resulting outcast status. The third element, Man Against Nature, will come into play shortly, and deals not only with the epidemic itself, but also the race against time in delivering the antitoxin, as well as the struggles through the brutal winter conditions of the Alaskan wilderness. Again, simple, yet effective. Boris tries to cheer Balto up, and we get a little back and forth between them. And then, we're introduced to two young polar bears, who kind of just barge into the movie. Muck and Luck, voiced by Phil Collins of all people, are the worst part of the movie. They're intended to serve as comic relief, but Boris already does that effectively while also serving more of a purpose in the plot, while these two are overly childish, to the point of being obnoxious. I never said this movie was perfect. Thankfully, the bears are not in the movie much. They get less than 15 minutes of screen time in a 75-minute movie, and they're relegated to being silent background characters for most of that. And, in fairness, they do get a mildly funny moment in here and there. You are not drowning because if you will pause one moment, you will observe, perhaps, Tide is out! We then get a scene of Balto sitting atop the prow of the boat at night, thinking about Jenna. And here, I'd like to discuss the visual style of the movie in a little more depth. As I've stated multiple times by now, many of the components of this movie's writing are fairly standard as far as following common tropes of the hero's journey. But where the film really shines 
and where the title of this video comes in, is in how the presentation elevates the otherwise par-for-the-course writing elements. As Balto is based, albeit loosely, on true events, the filmmakers took great efforts to bring the story to life in a way that conveys this, giving the look of the film a sort of rustic, folksy Americana aesthetic. Not only are the people, buildings, and locations drawn in a style that resembles late 19th and early 20th century paintings, but the environments and color palette really help to bring the atmosphere and tone of the film to life. Nome is located just south of the Arctic Circle, and as such, not only does it get exceedingly cold during the winter months, but the length of daylight hours drastically dwindles, leaving the region in a sort of twilight that lingers late into the morning and returns by early afternoon. Balto's animation style and color palette excel at conveying the cold and dark nature of Nome in the depths of winter, when the sun struggles to rise above the horizon for extended periods of time. Snow is rarely portrayed as merely being white. Instead, it takes on soft shades of pink and orange during the daytime, and frigid blues at night, with icy blue crusts and indigo pools of shadow. The sun itself rarely shines bright and vibrant, but is rather faded and weak, giving a sense of limited daylight hours, of sunrise and sunset rather than full daytime. Thanks to the use of oil paints in the background art, lights have softer edges, giving them a sense of glowing warmth fighting against the darkness pressing in around them. Visually, Balto is one of the most striking and beautiful movies I've ever seen, and I commend the art directors, animators, and background artists for their hard work. Seeing the movie, there is no doubt that their efforts paid off. The element of light will also come into play in another manner shortly, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And it's not just the visuals. James Horner's absolutely breathtaking score does an excellent job at complementing the animation and backgrounds. The mixture of strings, horns, and soft piano notes alternately gives the music a hauntingly somber air with notes of optimism and heroism, and this is particularly evident in the next scene, which kicks off the main plotline regarding the epidemic. We cut to the town, where a nervous Jenna waits outside the hospital. Rosie, seeing her faithful dog, runs outside to play with her as light-hearted music begins, but this quickly sours as the girl begins coughing violently, and her worried father hurriedly ushers her back inside. Jenna then goes to the window, watching as the doctor examines her owner, while in the shadowy background, Balto arrives. I saw this movie for the first time as a young child, and even today I can still recall how the soft, melancholic music and somber, hushed tones of the dialogue really nailed the impression that something serious was going on. She feels warm. She has a terrible cough. Balto, what's wrong with her? Balto and Jenna then sneak into the crawl space beneath the hospital, where the former shows the latter a trick of the light in an attempt to cheer her up, projecting the aurora borealis through a group of broken bottles. You're right. It's beautiful. Their wonder is cut short, however, when they hear the doctor and Rosie's father discussing his daughter's predicament, and the doctor gives the grim diagnosis. How is she? Exhausted from coughing. Her fever's getting worse. Looks like diphtheria. A horrified Jenna hurries out, but when Balto tails her, the two are confronted by Steel. The Malamute attempts to persuade Jenna to leave with him, offering links of meat he stole from the butcher whereupon Jenna tricks him into backing into the scalding boiler. And I have to say, this pun is pretty clever. <laughs> These days I prefer my meat. Cooked. Steele's cries of pain summon the nearby men, but he is able to frame Balto for the theft, and the wolf dog is driven away while Rosie's father drags Jenna home. After cutting to the town telegraph operator, who sends a desperate plea for medicine, we then get to witness various delivery attempts, as we hear his correspondence with other officials, and the situation grows increasingly dire. With the journey impossible by sea and air, the governor authorizes a shipment to travel by rail to the end of the line, in the town of Nanana, where it will be carried the rest of the way by dog sled. Once again, 
This sequence is an excellent example of how the animation and music combine to convey both the grave nature of the epidemic and the brutal conditions of the Alaskan winter, and therefore set the stakes for what our heroes must brave in order to save the ailing population of Nome. God willing, the train will make it through. Stop. Back in the town, a race is organized to select the fastest dogs for a relay, and here, Balto sees his chance to prove himself. After he sneaks into the starting lineup, we get a neat little sequence where, despite being undermined by the other participants, he manages to win the race. But in the aftermath, as the musher and another official come up to inspect the wolf dog, Steel provokes him into growling, and the men fearfully back away, leaving Balto behind as the rest of the team is prepared. Come nightfall, the sled team sets out, with the telegraph operator setting a red lantern at his office on the outskirts of town, telling the others, Yep, as long as there's hope for those kids, I'll keep this lit. Here we get the first overt use of one of the film's primary motifs, or visual themes, that of light corresponding to hope. Now, I know, I know, light equals hope is one of the most basic motifs in all of storytelling. After all, we are diurnal creatures with color vision. But as I've stated multiple times already, just because it's simplistic doesn't mean that it can't be used to great effect. And after all, this is a movie intended for children, so it makes sense that many of the elements would be rather straightforward and easy for young minds to interpret. Next, we get a great scene where a dejected Balto, sitting on the beach boat on the outskirts of town, watches grimly as the team vanishes into the wintry backdrop. Afterwards, we are shown a montage of the team crossing the distance between Nome and Anana before arriving at the train station, where the medicine is waiting. As the box of antitoxin is secured to the sled, a lantern is placed atop it continuing with the movie's primary visual theme, in effect keeping hope alive as long as the team is journeying. On the way back, however, Steel loses his bearings in a blizzard and fails to heed the advice of his teammates, venturing off the trail and failing to return by the expected time. As the telegraph stations along the route coordinate, the dogs back in Nome learn of the team's misfortune and gather to discuss it, coming to a bleak conclusion. What about... Them little ones. The medicine won't be here in time. We're going to lose them. And here we get one of the most impactful sequences in the movie, one that left a huge impression on me when I first saw it as a young child. We cut to the hospital, where Rosie lies sick and suffering in bed as her father pleads with the doctor to allow Jenna to comfort her in a touching scene. The room itself is brightly lit with warm light, but as Rosie's brief cheer at the sight of her dog fades, the camera pulls out to the cold, dark exterior, where Balto watches through a window. Please, Doctor. It's the only medicine we got. Okay. As the soft, somber, ominous music slowly builds, he hears the sounds of a hammer on wood, and goes to investigate. Peering into the carpenter's workshop, the wolf dog finds the man building child-sized coffins in anticipation of the pandemic's toll. Horrified, Balto then resolves to set out to find the missing sled team and lead them back in time. And I feel this provides a good vehicle for another aside. A frequent topic of discussion surrounding media aimed at younger audiences involves to what extent children should be exposed to so-called darker subject matter, particularly involving mortality. I for one am of the mindset that as all people will come across it at some point in their lives, it is better to ease children into familiarity with death through entertainment, and that seems to be somewhere in line with the general consensus. People often cite movies like Bambi, The Land Before Time, or The Lion King as impactful to their childhoods specifically because those films force them to confront a reality many even as adults would like to avoid acknowledging, that one day we all must die. When I first saw Balto at the age of 8 or 9, I was already well aware of death as a concept, and even of the fact that I myself would one day die. But death had always been something distant and vague. Sure, I'd seen people get shot, eaten by dinosaurs, and even dissolved by ghosts on the big screen, 
But since I wasn't expecting to be drafted into war anytime soon, and since dinosaurs were long extinct and I wasn't planning on messing with mystical artifacts, death never seemed immediate. But Balto gives us a different view of mortality. Instead of arising from some dramatic confrontation between mighty warriors or soldiers in warfare or savage beasts, death in this movie comes in the form of a disease, and a disease that not only affects children, but is specifically deadly to them. And the efforts that the writers and animators took to make the film more grounded in its portrayal of events, combined with my awareness that those events did happen in something at least remotely resembling the movie's portrayal, made it all the more real to me. It's funny how, looking back, some of the movies that I now consider to be my favorites actually elicited strong mixed reactions upon my first viewing them, and Balto is no exception. I was certainly gripped by the film as a young child, but my first viewing didn't leave me with the excitement and interest of Jurassic Park or Star Wars or Atlantis. It left me feeling uneasy, and forced me to come to terms, in some slight, childish way, with my own mortality. And for that, ultimately, I am grateful. So Balto sets out, alongside Boris and, unfortunately, Muck and Luck. Don't worry, they aren't too much of a distraction. Back in town, Jenna sits outside the hospital, sick with worry, when she picks up Balto's scent, and notices his trail heading out into the wilderness. Balto begins tracking the team, cleverly marking the trail by scratching out strips of bark from trees along the way. The team with the antitoxin, however, are hopelessly lost in the storm, when the others begin to realize this, Steel panics and leads them down a steep incline, where the musher is knocked unconscious. The dogs then huddle together, shivering against the wind and snow, as the camera pulls back, and here we see the faint light from the lantern struggling to shine through the enveloping power of the blizzard. We then cut back to Balto and his friends, who are walking through a forest. While the others make a great deal of noise, Balto gets a sense that they are being watched, and urges them to hurry after him. The group then encounters a grizzly bear, and are forced to fight for their lives as the beast pursues and attacks them. The animators did a great job of making the bear menacing, giving it shadowy fur with burning eyes, and using yellow and blue highlights to portray the play of light and shading on its fur. Balto fights the beast in an attempt to draw it away from his friends, but is pinned beneath its massive claws only for Jenna, who has tracked the group, to intervene and save him. She buys him time to escape before being injured. And as a little aside, it's nice that the writers gave her more of a role in the plot than just being the main character's love interest. She actually shows agency and is an active participant, even saving the hero's life, which, while hardly noteworthy nowadays, wasn't particularly common when the movie came out two and a half decades ago. Balto ends up being forced out onto a frozen lake, where the bear pursues him, even as the ice begins to crack. Eventually, the two plunge into the icy waters below, and the polar bears leap in after him. So, in fairness, they actually do serve one proper function in the movie. Balto is saved from the frigid water, and as Jenna helps to warm him up, she relays information about how to find the missing team. By the way, voice actors Kevin Bacon and Bridget Fonda really help to sell the chemistry between these two characters. Are you okay? Are you okay? Jen <laughs> I'm fine. As the group prepares to set out once more, Balto realizes that Jenna's leg was broken during the fight with the grizzly bear. Rigging a sled from a fallen pine branch, he convinces the others to bring her back to Nome while he will go on ahead. Jenna, at first reluctant, eventually agrees, and we get this wonderful little scene. Going on alone? Won't be the first time. Oh, here. I'm afraid it won't keep you very warm. Yeah, it will. What can I say? This movie's absolutely adorable at times. Yeah. Beautiful. As a token of her faith in him, and a reminder of the importance of his mission, Jenna places her bandana around Balto's neck, which will come into play later. Boris is ready to go on with him, but Balto convinces the goose to help lead the others back. And here, his old friend delivers what might be the movie's most iconic line. Let me tell you something, Balto. A dog cannot make this journey alone, but maybe a wolf can. The writers cleverly staged this scenario in order to remove the side characters from the main storyline, leaving Balto on his own as he forges ahead to find the missing team. 
Back in Nome, the telegraph operator learns that the storm is too severe for another team to be sent, and that the survival of the town's children depends on the missing team being located, which helps to maintain the tension as we follow our protagonist. Braving the brutal subarctic conditions, Balto eventually manages to track down the team. The dogs are surprised and relieved to see him, all except Steel, who assures the others that he has everything under control, despite this obviously not being the case. As Balto attempts to lead the team back, explaining how he marked the trail, Steel grows increasingly belligerent, even disregarding the safety of the medicine. I love how this scene is set up from a visual standpoint. The snowy backdrop is painted in cold, deep blues, with the rising sun casting splotches of fiery molten orange that seem to hint at the violence about to play out. Characters shiver as their fur blows in the frigid wind, and their breaths come out as clouds of vapor, really helping to accentuate the feeling of being trapped in the wintry Alaskan wilderness. Steel ends up assaulting Balto, who refuses to fight back, instead trying to rouse the others to bring back the medicine. During the course of this one-sided confrontation, the sun slowly rises in the east, spilling hues of burning gold and orange onto the combatants. Steel's behavior ends up alienating him from his teammates, and when he lunges for Balto's throat, the Malamute ends up grabbing hold of Jenna's bandana instead, slipping back and plunging over the cliffside into the cold darkness. Meanwhile, a triumphant Balto stands atop the ledge as the sun crests the horizon, imbuing the scene with a sense of warmth that corresponds with Balto being given the reins, both figuratively and literally, of the sled team. Steel, however, has other plans. Having learned of Balto's method of marking the way home, he marks different paths in order to confuse the team, which, when you consider it, is really evil. We've already seen how vain and conceited he is, but in doing this, he is actively willing to allow the sick children back in Nome to die merely to preserve his image and status. When Balto comes across Steel's markings, he recognizes that his rival is attempting to throw him off, but is unable to determine the correct course back to Nome. And as the other dogs begin to doubt his leadership, the wolf dog panics. Rushing blindly ahead, he ends up leading the team toward a cliffside, where the dogs barely manage to prevent themselves and the medicine from plummeting over. The ropes securing the antitoxin to the sled then snap, and Balto leaps to grab them, preventing the crate from going over the edge, only for the snow beneath him to give way, leaving both him and the medicine to plunge into the cold, dark depths below. The screen fades to black, and we then return to Nome, where Jenna has managed to make it back. She tells the town dogs about Balto's efforts to locate the lost team, but the others deride the idea of the half-breed Balto being able to guide the medicine back to Nome when Steel couldn't. And, speak of the devil, Steel himself bursts through the door, his coat crusted over with ice. As he recuperates in front of the fire, he spins a wild tale about how the other members of his team died one by one, leaving him to carry on alone through the blizzard. And it's pretty amusing how much he hams it up here. One by one they fell, frozen, barely alive. I, I pulled four onto the sled. <laughs> Three more on my back. And I, I walked. When the dogs ask about the medicine, Steel, ever the scummy manipulator, tells them that Balto found him, took the sled for himself, and then fell to his death, desperate to prove himself to the other dogs, and particularly to Jenna. As supposed proof, he retrieves the bandana that the husky had given to Balto. Jenna, distraught, tells the others that Steel is lying, reiterating her faith in Balto before leaving in anguish. And here we come to the crown jewel of this movie, arguably one of the best sequences in all of animation, and certainly one of my personal favorites. The White Wolf scene, also known as Heritage of the Wolf, for the phenomenal track of the same name that plays during the sequence. Since I'd like to let the scene speak for itself, as it were, I'll first show it in its entirety, and then break it down piece by piece.
tell you something, Noto. A dog cannot make this journey alone. But maybe a wolf can. absolutely breathtaking, and just as impactful to me all these years later as it was when I first saw it as a young child. So now, let's break the scene down. The sequence begins with James Horner's beautiful soft and somber score, as the morose telegraph operator steps outside and extinguishes the lantern, having given up hope that the team will return in time to save the victims of the epidemic. In the hospital down the street, Rosie's parents see this through the window, and turn to comfort each other in their grief as the camera lingers on their dying daughter. We then fade to a view from the outskirts of town as the music briefly rises, while one by one, the lights of the houses go out. But one remains. Jenna limps into the frame, lugging a lantern up the hill through the storm, a single faint light representing the last spark of hope for the children of Nome. Coming to the crest of the hill, she uncovers a pile of broken glass and positions the lantern nearby recreating the trick Balto showed her earlier in the movie. As a beautiful display of colors shines forth, mimicking the northern lights, she looks back into the camera and mutters a single name, the only hope now for the stricken town. We then cut to her lost companion as a series of heroic yet mournful horn notes sound, and Balto digs himself out from beneath the snow, silhouetted against the rising sun. Collapsing back to the frozen ground, he mutters Rosie's name before beginning to weep. But then, as the score takes on an ethereal quality, the camera pulls back to reveal a pure white paw. Staring up in confusion and then wonder, Balto watches as a massive, graceful white wolf stands above him before howling, as if attempting to connect with one of its own kind. Balto's wonder turns to dejection as his expression sours, and he turns away, still refusing to acknowledge his wild heritage. The wolf's gaze lingers on him before it too turns away vanishing into the storm. But as Balto faces away, his eyes begin to focus as the score takes on a sense of urgency, with distant drumbeats rising, and through the howling wind and snow, he spots the crate of antitoxin still intact, the lantern atop it shining through the blizzard. He then looks up the towering slope he fell from, the top of which is lit by the rising sun, and hears Boris's words from earlier. A dog cannot make this journey alone but maybe a wolf can. Balto appears on the verge of giving up, but then raises his gaze defiantly and turns back in the direction of the white wolf. The music swells, growing more optimistic as he approaches the vanished creature's footprints, and to his surprise, he finds that his own paw fits perfectly into the prints. Standing upright, he howls into the storm as the music crests with a thunderous crash of cymbals, and after a moment the wolf appears opposite him joining its own voice to his as Balto finally embraces his heritage. I know the whole this shot or scene is brilliant and should be taught thing has been memed to death by now, but honestly, Heritage of the Wolf is an excellent example of how to craft an animated sequence. Everything from the score, to the color palette and lighting, to the cinematography and shot composition works remarkably well to create a beautiful climax to the film, and I think it has gone a long way to explain why this movie is still so fondly remembered by so many people. This scene in particular conveyed the magic of filmmaking to my young mind better than anything I had previously come across, and while I had certainly been emotionally moved by sequences in other movies before, something about the construction of this scene and its grounding to real-world events connected with me in a way my 8 or 9 year old mind hadn't ever really experienced with a work of art before. So much is effectively conveyed with almost no dialogue, and while many of the techniques employed are simple, as with so much else in the film, the execution is nearly flawless here. How the lights of Gnome going dark is contrasted against Jenna's lantern, which summons the aurora before cutting to a shot of Balto silhouetted against the rising sun. How the white wolf goes from a massive beast looming over Balto to a creature nearly equal in size to him, 
as the wolf dog's confidence and pride in his lupine heritage rise, and how the entire sequence retains a mystical vagueness, beautifully elevated by James Horner's music. Is the white wolf simply an ordinary wild animal that recognizes Balto's ancestry and encourages him to recognize it in himself in turn? Is it some kind of nature spirit or guardian angel who appears to give him the motivation necessary in order to save the children of Gnome? Or is it merely a hallucination, a product of Balto's mind symbolizing his overcoming his inferiority complex on account of his half-breed status? Well, it's up to interpretation, but it doesn't really matter, because it works on all three levels regardless. As Simon Wells, Balto's director, said in an interview, The White Wolf's nature is deliberately unstated. The White Wolf sequence is still my favorite part of the movie, and James Horner's score that accompanies it still raises the hairs on the back of my neck. We wanted to keep it mystical and vague. Looking at the results, I can see why, and I'd certainly say that their efforts were not in vain. Afterwards, Balto manages to scale the steep cliffside, dragging the crate of medicine along with him. Reaching the top, he is celebrated by the other dogs before leading them back towards Gnome. Having gained confidence from embracing his heritage, Balto is able to use his superior lupine sense of smell to determine which markings were made by him and which were made by steel, allowing the wolf dog to navigate the treacherous terrain and find the way back home. In the falling action of the movie, the team encounters various other hazards, including an unstable ice bridge that gives way beneath them, an avalanche, and a frozen cave full of deadly icicles. As the dogs narrowly escape with the antitoxin in tow, we return to Gnome, where the townspeople are despairing over the apparent hopelessness of the situation. Just then, Balto's howl sounds in the distance, and the inhabitants of Gnome realize that the team has made it back. As the sled dogs enter the town to James Horner's jubilant and triumphant score, the lights of Gnome come back on, and the telegraph operator reignites the lantern he had previously extinguished. Steel is exposed as a charlatan before the rest of the town's dogs, the sled team members are celebrated as heroes, and the antitoxin is administered to the children in the nick of time. After being praised by the townspeople outside, Balto is welcomed into the hospital by Rosie's family, where he fetches her musher's hat from a nightstand and brings it to her bed, reincorporating this element from the character's introduction. And this whole sequence is just so wonderfully heartwarming. Balto, I'd be lost without you. <laughs> Jenna then enters, and Balto races over to her before the two embrace. Did I mention that the music in this movie is phenomenal? Outside the hospital, the assembled townspeople cheer, and the camera pans up to the northern lights shining above the city, which mesh into the shape of a howling wolf before fading as the film returns to live action. Back in Central Park, the old woman and her granddaughter approach a statue of a sled dog, and the little girl reads off the inscription, which, in its entirety, states, Dedicated to the indomitable spirit of the sled dogs that relayed antitoxin 600 miles over rough ice, across treacherous waters, through arctic blizzards, from Nanana to the relief of stricken Gnome in the winter of 1925. Endurance, fidelity, intelligence. The girl remarks on how the events of her grandmother's story really did happen, and the old woman hands her granddaughter a musher's hat. As the girl then races off with her dog, imagining the two of them in the place of the mushers of the serum run, the old woman remains behind a moment longer, staring wistfully up at the statue. Here, she repeats the line that Rosie delivered upon waking after being treated. Thank you, Balto. I would have been lost without you. Revealing to the audience her identity. The elderly Rosie then follows after her granddaughter, as the wind whispers by and a few notes of soft, reverent music begin to play. The film then ends with the camera pivoting around to rest on the statue of Balto, silhouetted against the setting sun giving us a final incarnation of the motif of light corresponding to hope, but with a little twist. Though the sun has set on the heroes of the great race of mercy, their memory and legacy lives on in the lives and descendants of those they saved. While Balto's portrayal of the 1925 serum run certainly deviates heavily from historical fact, 
The movie's framing, and the respectful and reverential way in which it approaches the real-life story, in my view justify these creative liberties. And though the story itself is fairly simple and straightforward, the film makes the most of its animated medium in order to elevate that story, featuring a distinctive visual style and color palette evocative of the gripping cold and long nights of the far north, an endearing emotional core, memorable and unique character designs, beautiful cinematography, an absolutely phenomenal score, and a fairly daring willingness, at least in relation to most mainstream American theatrical animation of its time, to maintain a more serious and grounded tone in keeping with its historically inspired subject matter. All of which, I believe, will allow Balto to continue to find a place in the hearts of lovers of animation for years to come. Country winter bolt tied to the road. She smiled and said nothing. I bared her my soul. And I knew that I loved her, but I couldn't say why. And all of that silence might well have been lies. She cried out, I love you, but I'll never be free. It ain't no use guessing, just forget about me. Прикрой меня! Я должен перезарядиться! Balto is based... Right, stop that! Silly! 